Does an elusive ape man lurk in the mountain vastness of the Himalayas? Explore the trail of a legendary creature whose image has haunted the human imagination since the beginning of time. Eight feet tall, covered with hair, yet strangely human-like, the abominable snowman has for centuries been deeply woven into the lore and legend of the awesome Himalayas. The people who live in the region, the Sherpas, call this creature the Yeti. Could such a creature truly exist? Could an undiscovered mammal, some type of half-man, half-ape, still roam the remote vastness of the world's highest mountains? I think the biggest uh, reason why most scientists are skeptical of there actually being a Yeti is that there really isn't any evidence for it. There have been a lot of sightings, uh, reports of sightings of large creatures up in the mountains in, the, say, the Himalayas, or even in North America with the uh, Bigfoot. There have also been a lot of sightings of Elvis. But even if the Yeti is only legend, there have been persistent sightings of this creature throughout history. Similar stories of Yeti-like creatures are reported from around the world. Perhaps the most famous is Bigfoot, or Sasquatch, of North America's Pacific Northwest. In the Amazon, an enormous ape-like creature called the Mono Grande is said to haunt the far reaches of the rainforest. In the snowy vastness of Siberia, nomadic herdsmen tell tales of the mysterious Almas, which leaves behind only huge footprints. The stories of hair-covered, man-like creatures have been told throughout history. The Bible, in the book of Genesis, tells of hair-covered giants who once lived in the world. There were giants on the earth in those days, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men and bore children to them. Genesis 6-2. The book of Genesis later describes another hairy man, Esau, the first son of the patriarch Isaac. Behold, there were twins in Rebekah's womb, and the first came out all red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. And after that came his brother, and they named him Jacob. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the wild places, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. Genesis 25:24. In the tale, Jacob displaces the firstborn Esau in his father's affections, and the hairy older brother is cut off from the inheritance of the chosen people. A similar tale is told in the mythology of another ancient people, the Babylonians. In the Epic of Gilgamesh, the hero Gilgamesh is called upon to go out and fight the primitive wild man called Enkidu. Enkidu's body was rough and covered with matted hair. He was innocent of mankind. He knew nothing of cultivated land. Enkidu ate grass in the hills with the gazelles and lurked with the wild beasts at the waterholes. The Epic of Gilgamesh, 2000 BCE. Tales of wild men also appear later in European folklore. Grendel, the monster of the old English epic Beowulf, is another example of the wilderness-dwelling hairy man. 
In woodcuts, illustrations, and stone carving, art of the Middle Ages continued to depict the wild man of the woods. Does the prevalence of the folk tales of the wild man mean that he must truly exist? There may be a more logical explanation for the wild man's persistence. Some scholars believe that the tales may be a recollection of an actual experience from the dim past, preserved in folk tales for millennia. What may be happening there is the possibility of an echo from an age uh, long, long, long back when Homo erectus migrated out of Africa. They migrated out of Africa about a million years ago, and they went up into Southeast Asia, arriving there about 800,000 years ago. But Southeast Asia was already populated by a giant ape uh, called the Gigantopithecus. There is no dispute that Gigantopithecus did exist. Fossil remains show that this largest of the ancient apes, standing at 10 feet tall, would have dwarfed the more advanced Homo erectus that encountered him. Could this huge but mild-mannered primate have been an early victim of humanity's drive to dominate the planet? By 300,000 years ago, the Gigantopithecus are extinct. And some scholars believe that their extinction uh, may have been uh, accounted for by Homo erectus hunting them and wiping them out over a period of time. If the legends of the Yeti, of Enkidu, and Grendel are based on fact, could it be that such a creature, halfway between man and ape, still exists in the world's most remote places? The abominable snowman of the Himalayas didn't gain notoriety in the Western world until the 20th century. Yet reports of the Himalayan snowman, or Yeti, have been common in Asia for hundreds of years. The 11th century Hindu poet Milarepa describes tales of the Yeti in several stanzas. A European ambassador from Bavaria traveling with the infamous Genghis Khan in the 13th century reported an encounter with a hairy, man-like creature in the foothills of the Himalayas. A Tibetan book of medicine from the 18th century describes the curative properties inherent in the flesh of a creature it calls a man-animal. Wild man lives in the mountains. His origin is close to that of a bear, his body resembles that of a man, and he has enormous strength. His meat may be eaten to treat mental diseases, and his gallbladder cures jaundice. Anatomical Dictionary of Disease, late 1700s. Accompanying the Tibetan and Chinese text is this illustration perhaps the oldest surviving picture of the Himalayan snowman. The ancient legend of the Yeti continues as current folk belief among the Sherpa people of Tibet and Nepal. The Tan Boucher Monastery in Nepal is the center of Yeti folklore in the Himalayas. Caps and skins supposedly made of Yeti fur are kept and revered by the monks. Leader of the monastery, Tan Poshe Rin Poshe, is a reincarnate lama, head of the oldest sect of Tibetan Buddhism. In the old days, there were lots of stories about the Yeti. When I was little, a Yeti was known to have visited Tan Poshe. 
and climbed over the roof of a monk known as Gaga Pendezangbu. Pendezangbu was temporarily paralyzed. The next morning, footprints were seen in the snow. This kind of story is somewhat common in the Himalayas. Sherpa villagers often recount tales of Yeti sighting. I saw a Yeti when I was 12 years old. I was gathering firewood with my father. Suddenly, I heard a commotion and asked my father to stop chopping. As we waited in silence, something passed below us. I did not see the whole body, but I saw the head. It was reddish. The shape of the head was conical. I realized that it was a Yeti. I was so scared that I could not move. These eyewitness accounts must be viewed with a skeptical eye, for what may seem real to a Sherpa villager may not seem as real to us. Native peoples tend to not have a very clear line of demarcation between the metaphysical world and the physical world. We in the West very clearly separate those. Uh, native peoples don't. So when they talk about the Yeti, they may be talking about uh, a biological animal in that sense, the way they interpret it, or they may be talking about um, part of their folklore, and they don't distinguish that. The Sherpa people themselves are quick to acknowledge the discrepancy between the Western view of reality and their own. Among our own people, Yeti is sometimes it is, belongs to the supernatural realm, sometimes it belongs to the natural realm. So there is not a clear-cut boundary. Yet for one Sherpa, the appearance of a Yeti was far more than simply a spiritual manifestation. In 1975, while herding livestock, a Sherpa named Lakpa Dolma experienced a brutal encounter with something large and dangerous. While herding livestock high up in the mountain slope, I heard a whistle. I thought it might be my older brother. Then I heard the ground shudder, and there was this darkness right behind me. The creature held me by my clothing and hair from behind and tossed me into a stream. After killing three cows, it crossed the stream and walked off in a strange twisting motion and disappeared over the ridge. Lakpa Dolma still carries the scars of what she insists was a Yeti attack. She is certain that the creature that attacked her was neither a bear, a snow leopard, nor any other familiar Nepalese animal. For the Sherpa, however, scientific evidence may not be necessary. I have to be realistic. I have to look at it from the scientific point of view. So from that point of view, you really have to get the concrete evidence that it exists. As a scientist, um, I cannot say uh, that Yeti exist. But um, as a Sherpa, when I'm in a real uh, wilderness condition, up in the high up in the Himalayas, camping on my own with very few people, I'm still frightened that it might come. Eastern belief in the Yeti has timeless roots. But Western fascination with the subject did not begin until the 20th century, when the first Europeans and Americans began to penetrate into the remotest parts of the Himalayas. While leading a failed assault on Mount Everest in 1921, British explorer Colonel Howard Berry came upon a series of human-like footprints 21,000 feet up into the Lakpa La Pass.
Intrigued by the bizarre discovery, he included the report in a telegram to a newspaper in India. The story caught the attention of the British press, who quickly dubbed the creature the Abominable Snowman. In the following decades, popular culture embraced the myth of the Yeti. Novels, movies, and comic books featured various incarnations of the elusive snowman. Growing popular interest in the subject prompted the British Daily Mail to mount its own 300-man Yeti expedition in 1953. After several weeks, the expedition returned with photos of footprints, but little else. Most scientists quickly dismissed the mysterious footprints as those of a bear, a wolf, or a large Himalayan monkey. Others insisted that the entire story was a hoax. Despite the scorn of the scientific establishment, various other expeditions journeyed to the Himalayas to track down the creature. Yet none of these missions returned with anything like hard evidence. But in 1957, a little-known scientific study led by a Texas millionaire named Tom Slick traveled to the Himalayas. Tom Slick was a multimillionaire of beef and oil uh, from Texas who was very interested in mysteries and he saw the Yeti as perhaps a half-human, half-missing link kind of creature and felt that if he could find the Yeti, perhaps he could solve medical mysteries as well as figure out the ancestry of man. What set Tom Slick's expedition apart from previous ones was that he focused on the Yeti as a zoological species, not as a horror show monster. His team members were scientists and zoologists, and his approach was to use stealth and tested methods of animal observation. It wasn't really a very big party. Some of the earlier expeditions had been 300 people, and Slick decided that that was too big, um, that it scared away animals, and if he really wanted to hunt Yeti, which were very elusive creatures, he wasn't going to send a whole bunch of people in there. Slick broke his expedition into two small crews. While one crew looked for Yeti footprints in the high snow country, the other searched the dense and uncharted jungle valleys. Here they found footprints, hair samples, fecal matter, and even the abandoned sleeping nest of a creature which they believed to have been a Yeti. Though this collection of twigs and leaves may not seem impressive, the find closely resembles the beds made by the African gorilla, which leads some to believe that the Yeti may be an undiscovered yet advanced primate. The Slick expedition also interviewed the Buddhist monks of the Pan Boucher Monastery high in the peaks of Nepal. The monastery had been a center for Yeti lore and worship for centuries. Several pelts and hats supposedly made of Yeti fur were kept at the monastery. There was one other relic that the monks held in highest regard. A mummified limb said to be the actual hand of a Yeti. The expedition leaders begged the monks to allow them to bring the hand to America for scientific testing. The Pan Boucher monks refused on religious grounds. With the request denied, the expedition members resorted to trickery. 
the story of the Pembroke hand is very interesting. What really occurred was Peter Byrne, from a previous expedition, knew that there was a hand of the Yeti in the Pembroke Monastery. So he went there, he tried to get it, couldn't get it easily, so he got one of the caretakers drunk. While the man was drunk, Peter Byrne took pieces of the Pembroke hand. He put him in his backpack, he walked across the border from Nepal into India. To prevent the discovery of his theft, Byrne had replaced the two stolen bones from the hand with two human bones, rewrapping the entire relic to appear as if nothing had been removed. This ruse would prove to be a time bomb for Yeti research, though initial tests on the hand seemed promising. And he gives it to W.C. Osmond Hill, a primatologist with the London University, who analyzes it and finds out that this piece of material is from an unknown primate. Uh, a really wonderful discovery that still lasts today. Ironically, this very same theft led to the public debunking of the Yeti myth. For in 1960, another expedition studied the Pan Boucher hand and came up with opposite conclusions. Sir Edmund Hillary, conqueror of Mount Everest, and Marlon Perkins of television's Wild Kingdom led a highly publicized Himalaya Yeti expedition. Hillary and Perkins examined much of the same evidence as the Slick expeditions and managed to leave with a purported Yeti scalp. Laboratory analysis proved that the hair was actually from a local wild sheep called the Seral. That was one of the really intriguing things about Edmund Hillary's expedition to find yetis in the Himalayas. Uh, they set out to examine the evidence and they came back and said there's no there there. There's no credible evidence for there being a large creature. For the Hillary expedition, the final piece of damning evidence was the Pan Boucher hand the same hand from which two finger bones had been stolen by the Slick expedition. Unaware that they were examining bones Peter Byrne claimed to have wired together, the experts immediately declared that the Pan Boucher hand and all the other evidence was a hoax. Hillary and Perkins felt the final nail had been driven into the coffin of the Yeti myth. The real truth may never be known since the complete hand was stolen in the late 1980s. A comparison of photos from the Slick expedition and those from Hillary's expedition is inconclusive. Sir Edmund Hillary and Marlon Perkins, they went over there for the express purpose to debunk the Yeti because both of those men did not believe in the Yeti. They went over there, they got the hand of the Yeti and looked at it and by that time it had been wired up by Tom Slick's expedition and uh, was a fake. They got the, a really a skin of a bear, said that wasn't a Yeti, it was a bear skin. They got a skull cap that was made in imitation of the Yeti, wasn't a Yeti. The Yeti was now relegated to the category of superstition and myth. Serious scientific interest in the Yeti would not return for decades. Tom Slick never got a chance to debate the evidence with Hillary and Perkins. He died in a private plane crash in 1962, his pursuit of the Yeti unfulfilled. Boxes of evidence and information from his expeditions remained unopened on the Slick estate for years until investigator Lauren Coleman uncovered them. The hard evidence brought back by the expeditions led by Tom Slick really were three different kinds of categories. There were fecal material droppings, there were all kinds of different hair samples and hair related material. As far as the fecal material that was brought back by Tom Slick, 
It was analyzed in laboratories in Paris and the United States. They found parasites of an unknown primate. This was really never publicized at the time. Material has recently renewed interest in the Yeti in some quarters of the scientific world. In a world thoroughly explored by modern civilization with satellite photos available of every inch of the planet, could it be possible that the world still holds secrets like the Yeti? Most of the large mammals that we know about uh, have been discovered and have been known about for many hundreds and even thousands of years. Occasionally, a large mammal or a medium-sized mammal is discovered, but it's pretty rare. We, we've got the large mammals pretty well mapped out. In the past, science's confidence in its own knowledge has occasionally been shaken. In Africa, stories of a mysterious, elusive, man-like animal were dismissed by Western science until 1864 and the discovery of the gorilla. As late as the early 20th century, few zoologists believed in the existence of another wondrous creature mentioned by natives. Then in 1915, living specimens of the giant panda were brought out of the bamboo jungles of central China. As recently as 1976, an enormous unknown species of shark, the Megamouth, was discovered when a 20-foot specimen washed onto the bustling beaches of Hawaii. Even today, the distant corners of Asia have proven to harbor surprises. One of the most important recent zoological discoveries took place in Vietnam in 1994. In a remote corner of jungle called the Lost World, zoologists discovered the existence of two previously unknown large mammals. The Muntjac is an antelope which spends most of its time in water. Its odd-shaped head has evolved so that its nostrils sit on top of its muzzle. Another creature, the spindlehorn, or Vu Quang, is a type of jungle-dwelling ox different from any other known species in the world. Could another discovery be waiting for scientists in the lost world? Natives speak of a third rare species in the Vietnamese jungle, the Nui Rung, an elusive man-like creature that bears a remarkable similarity to tales of the Himalayan Yeti. The wild man reports from Vietnam are not greatly detailed, but villagers have reported large, hairy, bipedal primates that they're sort of a little afraid of. And, and it fits the pattern. And you just wonder, you know, again, country after country after country with the same kinds of reports from people totally isolated from each other. Folklore only stretches so far. Um, it really makes you wonder a lot. Richard Greenwell conducted his own investigation into the recurring tales of the wild man in a nation that shares a border with Vietnam, China. In 1994, he led an American-Chinese expedition to hunt for the ape-like creature the Chinese call the Yeren. The reports from China that impressed us were those reports that came from simple people, peasants, uh, that they didn't even live in villages, some of them, but way out on little farms. Um, who really had nothing at all to gain by any of this. Some of them traveled some distance to come and talk to us. Um, they seemed sincere, and they were, they were getting nothing out of this. Four legs, so they never get down like this. But even the testimony of sincere eyewitnesses is not conclusive. Science requires physical evidence. 
Of course we have to take seriously eyewitness accounts, but eyewitness accounts without some sort of supporting evidence are not terribly reliable. Some of it is presented by people who are really very sincere. But sincerity is not the measure of truth. No matter how sincere you are, you can be wrong. Richard Greenwell's expedition brought several hair samples taken from scenes of Yeren sightings to the nuclear physics laboratory at the University of Shanghai. And what they were able to do is examine the amount of iron and copper in these hairs. For, for every species, like every species of primate, there's a certain amount of each. And uh, what they found in these hairs was the, the differences were, were quite striking. Physicists at the University of Shanghai established that the ratio of zinc to copper in these samples confirmed that the hairs had come from an as yet undiscovered species. Here were professional scientists um, some of the top nuclear scholars in China who felt that they had good evidence for a large unknown primate based on their physical analysis. This wasn't supposition or eyewitness reports anymore. This, this was actual physical experiments. Do these hair samples prove the existence of the creature variously known as the Yeren, the Yeti, and the abominable snowman? The rest of the scientific community has not yet weighed in on the results of the study. Why have stories of the abominable snowman and the wild man of the woods been reported in folklore around the world and throughout history? Scholars contend that the recurring tales of the hairy creatures should not be taken literally but are psychological remnants from our remote pre-human ancestors. The archetype of the wild man has been with us for a very long, long time. I think the wild man represents from the point of view of this idea of the collective unconscious, uh, the connection in hominid evolution with where we have come from, where we have been. It is a connection with our evolutionary past. Some psychologists and sociologists propose that the recurring myth of the wild man simply represents humanity's repressed animal desires, the primitive instinctual drives buried in every individual's personality. Yet a psychological theory doesn't cover all aspects of the Yeti. There is one more piece of evidence that some believe might solve forever the mystery of the Yeti. In 1996, video footage from the mountains of Nepal, called the Snow Walker Video, claimed to have captured for the first time the actual abominable snowman. The tape shows a male and female hiker from Belgium who fill 45 minutes of video footage with typical vacation shots of Nepal and their trek through the Himalayas. While climbing a hill, the cameraman turns back to shoot the couple's own footprints in the snow. Suddenly, the camera captures a strange figure. Of course, this film has no context whatsoever. You don't know who made it, you don't know where it was shot, you don't know when it was shot. So basically, this is not evidence, unless you can actually track down the source and ask these people some serious questions. The videotape seems highly suspect. The couple who taped this purported Yeti encounter have refused to reveal their identities publicly. The source of the tape, and indeed the actual location of the encounter, remain unrevealed. But 
the simple explanation for this tape would be the couple and their friend in the gorilla suit came up the trail, walked up the hill. He sat down there next to the trail, waited for him. The folks got halfway up the hill, turned around, turned on the camera and said, okay, Fred, time to walk. <laughs> and the guy in the gorilla suit gets up and he starts walking away and floundering through the snow. Jeff Meldrum is a university primatologist whose interest in ape and gorilla locomotion led him into a study of the Yeti. He believes that analysis of the video makes a hoax unlikely. My first reaction was, uh, in, in watching the, the Snowwalker footage, was, was akin to one of the first times I had seen uh, a gorilla up close in a, in a zoo its movement and, and some of the postures that it adopted were, were strikingly ape-like in character. At the same time, however, I was intrigued because then it sort of uh, made a transition from that ape-like posture into a, a fully upright posture. Though relative size of the creature is hard to determine, Comparison of the tracks on the video seem to show that the creature's footprints are significantly larger than the human's footprints. I am quite confident in my estimate of scale, which was derived from the, the witness's snowshoe trackway. Using that trackway as a scale, the subject had to be in excess of nine feet tall. When you are confident of a size in excess of nine feet, you have to ask, where did they find an actor to fill that costume? Whether or not this video proves to be evidence of the abominable snowman, it adds another piece to the convoluted jigsaw puzzle that is the hunt for the Yeti. From ancient Tibetan manuscripts to folklore of the Sherpa people, from eyewitnesses in remote villages to high-tech labs in both East and West, the search for evidence of the Yeti continues. Is there an elusive man-beast that survives beyond the borders of human civilization? And if so, why does proof seem to remain beyond humanity's reach? The problem many of us have is that the evidence is very strong in some cases, but on the other hand, it also seems very unlikely that such an animal could remain unknown to zoology in this time and this place. And, and so we have that, that problem of, of they both seem improbable, and yet one of them has to be True. Can we truly believe in such a curious myth? Most scientists say the search for the Yeti is not a question of belief, but a quest for knowledge. Oh, I hope there's a Yeti. I don't know a scientist in the country who wouldn't be excited by the idea of a, of a strange primate that's unknown, uh, of ancient uh, races of mankind, perhaps, in mysterious places. The problem is, I and most of the other scientists I know would really rather know than believe. And when you look at all of the evidence, um, it's pretty unconvincing, unfortunately. People often ask me if I believe in, in the Yeti, and first I'd have to say, we're really not dealing with beliefs. Uh, we're dealing with evidence and weighing that evidence, and um, is it compelling or not? Is it worth pursuing or not? And that's really what we should be looking at. Um, in terms of what I personally think, um, I think that the evidence is strong enough to pursue it. And I think that's a perfectly acceptable scientific approach. Whether science will ever find conclusive proof of the existence of the Yeti, only time will reveal.
Meanwhile, we might ask ourselves why we are so fascinated with the search for the snowman. Could it be a deep, primal urge to reconnect with our earliest origins, one upright ape to another? Through the Earth's most forbidding landscapes, the quest continues. Another invincible human journey in search of history.